Hello, uh, my name is Merle Massey. I'm the coordinator for undergraduate research here at the University of Saskatchewan. Today we have a special session with the Science Research and Society Club uh, with a guest speaker. And with that, Vedi He, as the director of the Science Research and Society Club, I'm going to pass it over to you. Thanks, Meryl. Welcome, everyone. This is exciting because it's our first meeting of the new term. So thank you for coming. And we're very excited to have Jay with us today, who's the editor of Canola Digest. Um, as we were talking before we started this, we've had a lot of interesting conversations on what science communication means and how to do it, especially students interested in research um, and, and, and STEM and how to put our best foot forward when it comes to explaining our research and what the impact of how we communicate our work has um, on how society understands science um, and research. And so we're very excited to, to learn about science communication today and also how to pitch um, if that's something we endeavor to do in the future. So thank you, Jay, for joining us and, and I'll hand it over to you for the presentation. And so thank you, Vedahi. And you're going to advance my slides. Is that how we're gonna go here? Meryl will, but yes. Mer Meryl, okay. Uh, all right, uh, so let's go to the next one. It's just a bit about me. Uh, so yeah, so there's me, and I'm a, I'm a, I've been a farm writer for almost 25 years. I started in radio in 1990. Well, actually, I did some summer work in 97, and I did radio in 98 for seven months, and I've been in print ever since. I spent 12 years with Farm Business Communications, which is a, a sprawling organization now that includes uh, Country Guide and Grain News and Manitoba Cooperator, and now as part of the Glacier team, Western producers in that family as well. And then the past 11 years, I've been with the Canola Council of Canada. I still consider myself a farm journalist because prim primarily what I do is, uh, is journalism writing for farmers. I also do some podcasting and uh, tweets, that kind of thing. So if you ever want to pitch me or if you want to talk further, jot down my contact info there. But let's get rolling. Next slide, please. OK, uh, I, these are the five key points I'm going to cover off through the presentation. So this is just a, a repeat. But it is part of how you would structure a presentation uh, to people. If you want to present your work um, through a webinar, say like this, identify that the key points you want to get across, post them at the front, go through them, post them again. It's kind of re repetition that helps you um, get your point across. All right, so here are the five key points. You can read them. I'm not gonna go through them now because I am gonna go through them as we go along. So let's go to the next slide. All right, pitch. So the, the whole reason why I'm here is to talk about how to pitch and what I do with pitches. And here's the really important thing for you. I hardly get any pitches from researchers. Uh, in fact, I can't remember the last time a researcher pitched me. So researchers, um, for some reason, don't feel like they need to reach out to media. So if you could learn that early on, uh, I think you, you'll really have a leg up. Uh, I, I don't know why researchers don't pitch, but um, maybe it's because they feel like uh, they don't really need media attention for their work, uh, as long as uh, they're getting accolades from their own uh, faculty, say, or they're getting printed in peer-reviewed publications. That could be it. I mean, the mainstream media uh, maybe isn't super high on their, on their list, but that's how you get people talking about your work. That's actually how you get your work um, put to use. So I think that's probably why you're doing this research with the hope that someone like the, the vast world out there is going to pick up on it. So pitch, please. <laughs> All right, next one. All right, so the, so Charlie Mayer was the um, he was the uh, egg minister, federal egg minister in the Mulroney era. So this is way way before your time, but it is it's within my time, um, and that was in the eighties and, and early nineties. And I was at a presentation of the Prairie Oak Growers Association in Portage La Prairie, Manitoba. And uh, Charlie got up and he's a big tall guy and he's kind of leaning out over the audience and, and he was telling oat, the oat growers how great a crop oats was. And he says, if you don't toot your own horn once in a while, someone's gonna come along and use it as a spittoon. 
and uh, I'm, I'm hoping you know what a spittoon is. I've never really seen one in action, but you know, in the old Westerns, when you were chewing your tobacco, you would spit into a spittoon so you didn't have to spit on the floor. Yeah, so if you don't toot your own horn, uh, someone else is gonna spit into it. <laughs> okay, next slide. All right, um, relate to the audience. Uh, and so we're gonna get into some, some tactics here, but the key is you need to know who you're talking to and speak their language is what it boils down to. Next slide, please. So I've got a couple of tips here. Um, so tell a story, um, create an image, get personal. You probably, well, okay. So I, I've got a colleague, Nate Ort uh, with the Canola Council. He's a very bright young man, um, just out of university. In fact, I think he's going back uh, to take a master's or something. Um, but he writes in the uh, in a very uh, <laughs> scientific way, and so he'll I'll send him I'll be I'll have written up an article and I'll send it to him, and he strips away all of like the interesting stuff. <laughs> so I told him once I said Nate, um, maybe you're writing for a scientific audience, but uh, I'm writing to relate to people. So uh, quit uh, taking away all my personality. <laughs> I think it's okay in science to have a personality, um, even if the the um, you know the peer-reviewed journals aren't looking for anything remotely close to that, uh, which is fine. You you write. This is why I'm saying you write for your audience. So write for the peer-reviewed journal, but when you're talking to me, I don't want to hear all that stuff. I maybe want your abstract, a little bit about your methodology. Let's let's see the the key results, but I want to know a story about the research. I want to know why you did it, why it's important, uh, what you learned, uh, maybe some of the struggles along the way, uh, that, that kind of stuff. Tell me about your colleagues. Tell me about uh, your background. Uh, and I, I think that sure helps relate to an audience when they have a feel for who you are. You, you could never read a peer-reviewed journal and know, oh, I know, I, know, I understand where that person is coming from. I mean, that's not the point of them. But that's, that's what I want to know. Next. All right, so the, this is one of, I think, my best lead, uh, lead sentences ever. And that this is from an article that won me a gold at the Farm Writers. So I guess someone else thought it was okay too. So Jocelyn uh, Velostock did a lot of spitting the first time she met her future father-in-law. So some of you might know Jocelyn. She's, she's very well known in uh, soil science circles in Saskatchewan. She farms at uh, Broadview area um, and uh, has cattle. Anyway, she, she, as a soil scientist, she wanted to you know, mellow the soil so that she could get a real feel for the quality of it. And so she was out touring the farm with her future father-in-law and she would pick up samples of the soil and it was, she said it was fairly dry. So she would spit into it and then work it up so she could smell it and get a feel for it. So I thought, well, she told me, as soon as she told me that story, I thought, okay, there's, there's my lead. Anyway, so you get to know a bit about Jocelyn and it's something that's interesting and it makes you want to read more. Next. Okay, so there's lots going on in the world. You probably have, even within your research, um, you know, you might be looking at a whole bunch of different things. So how do you decide what, what to talk about? Um, that, I mean, what the point is, if, if you're telling me a story, try to think of, maybe even think ahead of time when you're making your pitch, what's the one thing I want Jay to get out of this conversation? What, what do I want to show up in the magazine or in a podcast? Because chances are, um, people are only going to remember a couple of things from, from the read or from the listen. So if you have a key message that you can repeat a couple of times, um, that, that really is essential to getting your point across. So have, have, think of one sentence. And uh, Rhonda Moore, who you'll learn a bit more about later, um, she's a colleague of mine on the, the Science Writers and Communicators of Canada board. Rhonda is... Uh, one of her tips was to, to make sure you could, or try to be able to explain your key message in 20 seconds or 20 words or less. It's a challenge, but it's worth a worthwhile challenge. 
next. I'm just trying checking out the chat. Okay, yeah, I guess this is related. Why why are you telling me this? So that's that's the key. When when you're trying to think of your, you know, your key point, um, answering that this question. Why are you telling? Why are you telling me this story? <laughs> that will help you pick out what your key message is. Next, no. Okay, so Noelle Chorney. She's also on the board of the Science Writers. So actually, I've got a. I went out to my my colleagues on the board and I said, "What? What should I'm doing this presentation? Um, do you have any tips that I could share?" So Noelle gave me this one, and it relates to the slide I just put up there. Uh, Noelle is in Saskatoon, works for Tall Order Communications. I think she is Tall Order Communications. Uh, ask yourself, who cares? And she said, or less harshly, but I thought I'll just toss that in there. Why does it matter? Um, so if you can't draw connections to your audience's values or things they care about, you've got a much steeper uphill battle. So say if you want to pitch me and um, it's for something you think is going to be for Canola Digest magazine, don't tell me something about your wheat research or your, your pea, pea or lentil research. Um, I mean, maybe I could use it, but the likelihood is very low. A soil research, yeah. I want to hear about that. Uh, crop nutrition, for sure. So if it's not, maybe it doesn't have to be specifically about canola, um, but if it has something to do with, with, you know, some benefit for canola growers, I want to hear about that. Um, so there's lots of stuff going on in, in Saskatchewan uh, that maybe you wouldn't exactly connect with me. So make sure if you want to, especially when you're pitching me for the first time, pick something that's uh, quite likely going to capture my attention. And then if you've got some other good ones, maybe save those for after we've we've connected at least once. <laughs> what do you think are good ones, but that maybe might not be a high priority for me. Uh, if you want to go to the Western producer, they're much more general, but also they're they're more newsy. So you need something that's timely for the producer. Um, and it really has to be a high level message like for, for their broad agriculture audience. At least that will help. Um, again, so anything to do with soil sciences, climate's a hot issue now, um, uh, biodiversity. So th th there's lots of things going on that will be, will be of interest. Um, just know who you're pitching to. But again, like I said, pitch. And give, the, give me a call, give the editor or the producer a call. Uh, kind of have some notes jotted down as to what you wanna say during the call or, or start with an email, then a call, but, um, but know who you're talking to. Next. Yeah, so here's Rhonda. So Rhonda is a, a brilliant person. She's in Ottawa. She's, she works for a think tank called the Institute on Governance. So she, basically she helps people, uh, well, not basically, because she has a lot of things on the go. But when it, when it comes to science communications, she actually, uh, she teaches something at, at Carleton. Uh, university, and uh, she has a bit of a checklist, which I shared with with you. I think um, you'll you'll have that at least in your inbox sometime soon. Uh, I've got it, Jay. I just haven't sent it around yet. Okay, yeah, okay. You bet. I'll be sending yeah. it around to everyone. Thank you. Yeah, you bet. So Rhonda's got a very simple one pager on on how to communicate science. So I'm going to be borrowing some of her ideas, but you'll have the the original with all its details coming to you shortly. Um, yeah, so what's the, again, this is getting repetitive, but that's okay, because that's how you get the point across. Um, what's one thing you want the audience to remember uh, from, from your presentation? Um, again, so pick that one key line, phrase, take home message. And then think about the most important medium. Print is, is very good, but it's not always the best. Um, maybe a podcast is better. Uh, Western producer does podcasts. Well, the whole the whole farm business communications. It's called Between the Rows. Um, uh, YouTube. Lots of institutions do YouTube. Uh, Real Ag. Uh, Sean Haney's company, Real Agriculture. They do tons of video and they're excellent at it. Uh, or you could do a, a presentation. So there's lots of farm forums, especially in Saskatoon, almost all winter long. Um, if you want to do a live presentation, 
um, you could ask me and I could help you out there. But uh, sometimes it's, and especially if you're a very dynamic person, like to talk with your arms, and uh, uh, you, you don't mind getting up and doing public speaking, especially if you had a, a background in 4-H like me. Um, so maybe a live presentation is, is the best way to go. You could practice with your class. Um, I do podcasts as well. Uh, so if you ever, if you have something you think uh, you'd like to chat about with a podcast, good. Uh, uh, I was just going to try to think of a, oh, yeah, so, and I'll get to um, uh, Christina shortly too, but um, I've got a pod, she, she asked, I asked her who she would recommend for a podcast, and she also recommended a colleague of mine, uh, Sunita Legallo, a colleague on the Science Writers Board. Uh, Sunita has a podcast called uh, uh, Music, <laughs> oh boy, uh, Music and PhD um you can uh, you can look it up it's in spotify actually i was just listening to it this morning after uh, christina recommended it but um she she kind of thinks about how sounds uh, and science go together so she's got kind of a unique approach to talking about science okay next keep it simple how am i doing for time here i'm 17 minutes in i'll, I'll try to go a little quicker again keep it simple um now now this isn't just this is why I have this in here. It's not just about the, the short 20 word explanation. It's also in the language you use. It, in science and certainly in agriculture, we've got acronyms galore. Um, and, and within canola circles, I can barely understand what my colleagues are saying sometimes because they're using so many acronyms and I have, have to ask them what that means. So imagine if you're not in this, this family. Um, so avoid jargon. Uh, use the simplest uh, words you can think of to explain science. And if, it, if you can't think of a simple word, then try to think of an analogy uh, to describe how a cell consumes proteins or whatever, um, you know, that kind of stuff. And because and, you, could, you could be using your language and it's completely lost on people. And again, it comes back to the audience. Uh, I was at a very technical scientific uh, seminar and uh, they are, they are all speaking the same language and it was, they are very high level. That's okay, that was the audience. Um, I felt lost, but it wasn't for me. I was there trying to take notes. Um, but, but if you're pitching to me for a farmer audience, which is my audience, um, uh, speak a language that, that anyone can understand. And that usually means not scientific language. Doesn't have to be, don't dumb it down. Just keep the language simple. Next. Okay, let's. So this is this is Rhonda. This is Rhonda's tips on keeping it simple. Simple. Be brief, uh, and with or an oral presentation, be repetitive. And I think I'm demonstrating that last one to you today. <laughs> okay, next. And there's Christina Sanza. So she's with Concordia University of Montreal. Um, and she said, present as, as if you were explaining the scientific concepts to a grandparent, which is perfect. Okay, next. Be positive and enthusiastic. I don't know whether any of you have heard Jeff Shea now speak. He's a, he's a soil science guy there at the University of Saskatchewan. He might be one of the more enthusiastic speakers I've ever heard. If there's anyone created for a live presentation, it's Jeff. And if you haven't had a chance to hear Jeff speak at, at something, I just love his energy. Um, and then there's another guy at the University of uh, Calgary named Paul Gelpern. And Paul is leading research on uh, non-farm non spaces. So you can imagine, especially in the pothole regions of Saskatchewan, there's a lot of bush, um, wetlands, uh, you know, areas that are maybe too saline, so they have gone to weeds. Uh, so there's, there's lots of areas within farms uh, that aren't producing annual crops. So Jeff's research, he's trying to put a value on that. And um, so, you know, if you've got 30% of your farm, uh, does that increase the yield? If 30% of your farm in non-farm spaces, does that increase the yield of, for the other 70? And I think he's finding that it does. Uh, he will admit that there's more work to be done, but I could just listen to that guy all day. He's got so much energy and he speaks with, uh, he's got good turns of phrase. Um, and again, there's a guy just perfect for, for a live presentation. I've done podcasts with them and it's, they're really a lot of fun. So, you know, uh, pitch, 
and be positive, enthusiastic about, about what you're doing. That sure makes it more interesting for me. If you're enthusiastic about it, that, uh, that, that helps. That opens my ears, that's for sure. Next. Yeah, there you go. So Rhonda's point was, uh, if you seem disinterested when you're presenting, uh, you, I can pretty much guarantee your audience is going to be disengaged. And it's so easy to be disengaged on Zoom. <laughs> uh, I've been on so many Zoom presentations. I'm Zoomed out. So I really appreciate you being here. You're probably almost Zoomed out too. But um, uh, the, you have to be a pretty dynamic speaker to, to keep your audience engaged on Zoom. And if you feel like you can't keep them engaged for an hour, maybe you can shorten it up. So on that note, uh, that brings me to the end. Just kidding. Um, Christina Sanza, yeah, uh, be wary of hype language. Oh yeah, so don't like go in there, Jay, I've got, I've got a breakthrough uh, technology for agriculture. Oh yeah, okay. And nobody else knows about it? <laughs> How breakthrough is it? Uh, maybe it is breakthrough, you never know, one in a, one in a million. But uh, be careful how you hype uh, your project. <laughs> okay, next. All right, so here are my five key points again. Yeah, so please pitch. Um, it's not that common, so you'll be way out in front if you uh, if you actually uh, even try pitching. Even if you think you're going to suck at pitching, uh, the fact the fact that you try it uh, puts you way in front of everybody else. Um, I'm not saying I don't get any pitches. I don't get pitches from from researchers or scientists. I mean, I, I dig around and find ways to connect with researchers and scientists because that's what I need to do. Um, but companies are very good at it. They're pitching all the time. News releases, cold calls. Uh, they, they really want me to talk about their stuff, obviously. So they're masters at it. Uh, scientists, though, not so much. Uh, yeah, relate to the audience. So who, you, who do you want to pitch this to? Who, who is that person talking to? And frame accordingly. Uh, whittle it down to one key point that you want to make, maybe a couple, but one major one. Uh, speak in a simple language that everybody can understand and be, be positive and enthusiastic. Okay, let's get into oh, there are a couple things. So if you want to be part of the Science Writers and Communicators of Canada, there's a $35 student membership. Just go to sciencewriters.ca. It would be great to have you. Um, we have lots of uh, membership from Central Canada and from BC, the prairies, I would say, are underrepresented. Represent, uh, underrepresented. Oh, that's a tough word. Um, so join, join up, and uh, let's get these prairie uh, participation rates up. Uh, and then there's also the farm writers. So uh, Saskatchewan Farm Writers Association, and in neither organization are there are we mostly journalists. There's it's actually mostly like non-journalists, other communicators. So you could, uh, even if you're not a journalist, um, you could definitely find a home in either of those organizations. And they're both fantastic. Uh, Farm Writers uh, is such a great family of people. Um, and the science writers, who I don't know as well because I haven't been involved for as long, um, they're also, I mean, the people I work with on the board, I say work, it's volunteer, uh, who the, are, are so great. So, and they're, they're young and they're enthusiastic and you get lots of uh, good information from them. Okay, next. All right, who wants to uh, tell me a bit about uh, the exciting work you're, you're doing? Anybody want to lead off? And I'm going to, so I've got the chat here. I'm looking, I've got two screens. So my chat is up a bit off the, so we could pot up the mics and we could just have a conversation for the next 35 minutes. Um, and it, it could be totally casual. You could, uh, if you're a little bit shy about, you know, taking center stage, just just tell me, uh, tell me what you're doing. What are you working on? Okay, so we got Sheila in psychology, which I, I, I haven't taken any psychology courses, but I find psychology very interesting, especially if you wanted to do anything like marketing. How does a person think? Maybe you're not into that, Sheila. There's lots of things going on in psychology. We have Amy in computer engineering and computer science. Uh, oh, Beta, he is also oh, your bioinformatics. Okay, I'm going to start with the physics, Hacken. I don't, if I say your name wrong, please correct me. And Merle, I keep saying you Merle, but maybe it's uh, Merle. Um, but I, I grew up with a Merle, and that's how we said Merle's name. So oh, it is there. Merle. You are just <laughs> fine. <laughs> okay. All uh, right. Uh, or are they saving their pitch for journal articles? But it should be. Yes. Yeah, right. 
um, back to my point at the top, don't just pitch to journal articles. You'll probably get fit into a regular magazine way faster, <laughs> way faster results. Uh, or does it put it Okay. Yeah. Do it. Don't use a $20 word when a $1 word would do. Exactly. Well, thank you. Okay. So I'm going to put Veda He on the spot. So what Veda He, what is bioinformatics? Um, okay, so the best way to describe it is it's like this interdisciplinary field that brings together many different fields. So it stands at the intersection of biology, computer science, statistics, math, um, and it's using all those different techniques to understand biological data, to understand biological systems or problems. So um, like current research that I'm working on is this deep learning project where we're building models, taking um, phenotype data from farming, like fields that we've been provided um, and related to, to lentil um, and matching that with genomic data. So you have this genomic data and phenotype data um, and then putting it through the model and trying to get predictions so that you can take this model and use it in the field um, to say, okay, if I want to use this, um, this line of lentils this year or this uh, genomic sequence of lentils this year, what type of growth patterns will I see in my lentil crops? What type of flowering patterns yeah. will I see? How will that impact my yield? So that's like the one, I guess, the one application of bioinformatics. So what I would, so that is so amazing and it's, it's very complicated. So the simplest thing for me, if I was gonna talk to a farmer, and I'm going to get, yeah. there's a couple of things you said there that I'm going to talk about first. So, so you, you'd say to a lentil grower, okay, so what are the conditions in your crop right now or in your fields right now? So I can help you pick the exact right lentil variety for those conditions. You know, mm -hmm. I, I think that's all, is that ultimately what, ultimately what you're trying to get to? Yes, that's one application, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm which I think would be really valuable. We don't even talk about that kind of stuff in farming in Western Canada yet. Um, oh. I mean, farmers will look at sort of general yield data or they like, oh, so, okay, so there's a lentil, that's the best yielding lentil. Um, mm -hmm. And there was, a, there was a demonstration near my farm, it was really good. It's got um, the disease, it's got resistance to vascochyte or whatever lentil diseases are, are more important. Um, so I'm just gonna go with that one. Meanwhile, there's like maybe 10 possible choices and is that really the best one for your farm that year or based on the conditions that we it maybe isn't so i'm going to help you make the right decision because i've got i'm building up this database uh something we've never had before a tool we've never been able to use before i'm going to bring that to you and that's going to help you make better seed decisions so i didn't use phenotyping or genotyping yeah, because exactly. I I even I have to think. Okay, what does that mean again? And I've right. heard those words many times. And Nate Nate is the phenotype Nate Ort. Everybody should get yeah. to know Nate. He's at U of M, but uh, he he's he's the phenotyping whiz. And so he's he speaks circles around me sometimes, and I have to like, tone him down. But uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> anyway, that's really good. That's that's really important work. Farmers are really going to like that. Uh, and so it's really interesting how you broke it down. I'm thinking about it and it's really interesting because I've done this, I tried to find ways to think, like make this succinct when you can when you communicate and you're right, the words phenotype and genotype, as long as you get across the meaning, they don't need to be used necessarily. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think, so I would, I would, you know, when, once you have something you feel you can talk about, um, and that doesn't mean published necessarily. I know in mm -hmm. science, they want to see it published before you want to talk to anybody. And maybe that's why I don't get a lot of pitches. Um, but I think you could, you would have experiences with that research um, that would be interesting. If you went to like Sask Pulse, who has a magazine, um, uh, and there's also uh, uh, Pulse Canada um, organization, these, you could do a presentation to their organizations or you could write a little article for their magazines. I would start there. Uh, if like when you want to take it to this, when you start want to start sharing your results, mm -hmm. there's lots of really good small magazines, and it's a good way to, for you to try out your skills at communication as well. Low pressure. <laughs> Thank okay. you. Yeah, you bet. 
Right on. I know that uh, um, a lot of the people who who are here today may not necessarily be publishing, you know, in in, in agriculture. And certainly, you know, my own work as a historian, I am a, a farm and agricultural historian um, to a large extent. So I end I end up in the in this space quite a lot, and I have published in places like the Western Producer. But um, just sort of think just because some of the examples from today might be coming from agriculture that I want everyone to kind of just think about those, the, the larger, um, yeah, the way that Jay broke it down in terms of that larger, you know, have your pitch, decide your one key point, um, think about your audience, make sure you're aiming directly for that audience. All of these are huge communication skills that I don't care what discipline you're in, um, they're, they're absolutely key for. So um, don't be afraid to talk to Jay just because you're not in agriculture, because yeah. um, Jay has lots and lots of editorial experience, and he can hear what, what you're doing and, and turn it around for you. So Hakan, go ahead. Yeah, let's, yeah, excellent. So let's hear about the physics, which is very interesting. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Energy or, yeah. and security. Okay, good. Right. Energy security. Yes, uh, I'm sorry that my camera is not working. Actually, I wanted to turn it on, but so uh, you can hear me. Okay. Yep, loud and clear. Okay, good. Thank you. So, because I'm smiling as I was uh, been listening to the conversations and your your talk. Um, so, my general project uh, thesis is about looking at power outages in the north. Uh, northern remote communities okay. and electricity, uh, uh, losing electricity and all that. Um, but one of the things that hasn't been looked at is the uh, while these communities of the north uh, have been living for millennia, going through uh, these kind of things, even without the advances in electricity, They've been coping, they've been living with the land and being doing okay. So what I want to look at, the social aspects of the this community's resilience, how do they survive? What do they do? When there is power outages in where I came from Nebraska, people panic, uh, but the conditions of uh, Nebraska compared to Northern remote communities are nothing to compare. So while there has been a lot of attention given to the providing infrastructure and looking at uh, implementing, um, say, wind energy, solar energy, which is very important, but, but what has been not looked into the social aspect, which is, I think, a lot of potential for us to learn not just scientists, but also government utility companies to learn about you know, what can we learn from the indigenous communities on their values and then their social resilience aspect and be able to communicate that uh, through that. So, and the goal is to make a model where I combine that social aspect of resilience, which is my big project, big idea, and in, inject some physics into it. That's, that's the idea. Okay, so this is the first time I've ever heard of physics and social sciences combined. Mm -hmm. So that's that in itself is very interesting. Uh, I think I think what what I want to hear about right off the top when you're okay. telling this story is pick uh, an example of a of a northern Saskatchewan community, say that lost power, and what happened after that. Okay. So was it was it a mad scramble? Was everyone burning their house down? No, uh, it was it was very orderly because they've this is something uh, that they've experienced before. Um, they went. So what what happened after the power went out in that town? Um, and and so this tell that story and say okay, we everyone gathered in one place. They put a fire on. Um, it was crowded, but this is how we survived. Um, people were making food over the fire. They made a stew. I don't know. I'm just obviously rambling here. But I think that's how you have to lead in to the story about how you're, you're studying that resilience and how we could use that in Nebraska or in, or in Saskatoon that's when the power goes out. It, not everything has to shut down. 
And then, and then maybe if you then weave it finally into, you know, what's going on on the physics side? Is there a physics solution here? Or, or if you're just doing the social side of things, fine. But I think you could, your thread could go from, you know, that specific example to then how do we react uh, better in a, in a power outage? And then how can physics uh, help us, you know, what are some physics solutions to, to uh, cope with a, with a power outage? And maybe that's just, it could be simple stuff like, this is how you need to preserve the energy that's within your home for as long as possible uh, until the power does come on. I think that that is so interesting. I think that's something for the Star Phoenix or what's the Saskatoon paper? Is that the Star Phoenix? Yes, I think so. Yeah, I, I think there's a very good human interest story there. Um, Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, really good. <laughs> I right, wrote can, can, down. Yeah, go ahead. No, that's I, I just I would I look forward to reading that. So make sure you send me the link when it's posted. I will. Thank you, Jake. Thank you. Thank you. Right, let's thank let's you. stick with psychology. I guess I mean the social sciences. Let's go to psychology with Sheila. Sheila, can you tell me a bit about what you're working on? Maybe we don't have Sheila anymore. Sorry, sorry. Oh yeah, okay, good. There we go. Good. Hello. Hi. Um well I'm not really working on anything right now, but I have an idea based on my own little self-study I did last year. So I'll just about give you a rundown of that. Yeah. So last year I did um uh like a little self-study. I just wanted to see how long I could go with zero social media. So I made it to 50 days, but it was nuts, <laughs> crazy emotions and feelings, both good and bad. But um, even with COVID too, social media was an important factor for people who had to isolate, but it was still, still pretty hard for lots of people. So what I think is that, well, pandemics will always keep coming, usually come every hundred years or something. So what I wanna know more about is testing people with different personality types and how they can handle 100% social media isolation just for like 10 days though, because I think that should be doable for people, especially the heavy social media users. And then I can refer back to my own journal entries that I made when I did my own volunteer isolation. So I think that my research could help people understand how they will react and I'll find research on things that will help them with isolation in any way. So even in different circumstances, like if you're stuck on an island or something or in the desert or something, and you need to kind of have that, I guess, idea of what you can do to handle that, to survive longer. Sheila, I think that is the most clickbaity thing I've heard in a long time. My 50 days without social media. <laughs> I, that, I, I want to read that tomorrow. Are you are you writing it right now? I did it last year, but I have all the journal entries oh, saved. That would be so interesting. And so the, the challenge for you would be to whittle that down. And, uh, and, and so maybe, maybe you need to start with day 50 or something like that. Yeah. Uh, but and then go right back to, you know, why you did this. And, and here's a diary of how like day one, day two, day three, day seven, day 14, day okay. 35, day 50. So you've got kind of six days. And then, I mean, if you're in psychology and you probably took really good notes, be as honest as you feel comfortable being uh, with, with the honesty about your experience um, and how that made you feel. Uh, okay. I thought it would be, I mean, it's a, so yeah, self-study. I don't know whether there would be a scientific journal that would ever publish a, a self-study analysis. Maybe yeah. in psychology there is, um, but that's the kind of thing that uh, mainstream media would, would lap up in my mind. Yeah, yeah. That's why I kind of wanted to do the, the 10 days with other social media users. Yeah. Because I, yeah, 10 days would, should be okay. I think there's, and, and, and it's really timely because yeah. um, social media is just getting nastier, it seems. And yeah. there's lots of people who are active, say on Twitter, Merle, you know all about this, um, especially this past week with some of the, in, in agriculture, there are some conversations about women and, and uh, farm, farm wife. Yeah. <laughs> Roll my yeah. Eyes. Anyway, 
um, there's people who are really thinking about tuning out of social media. Mm-hmm. So if, if you yeah. kind of said, okay, this here, here, here are a few people who did it for 10 days and this is yeah. how they felt after those 10 days. Uh, like they, did they feel lost? Did they feel an, an immense relief? Um, did they feel totally disconnected? You know, I, I think exploring some of those feelings would be would make for some really interesting articles. Yeah. Yeah. This is really good. There's like I think we're three for three here now on uh, <laughs> on really exciting stuff. Uh, and this is I think probably not enough scientists uh, have these conversations because they don't realize how what they're doing might might actually be interesting to more people. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Yeah, you betcha, Sheila, good. Uh, Amy, do you wanna talk about computers? Merle, Vedahi, do we have Amy still? Anyone else wanna? I might not Amy have it. Amy says, no official research projects right now, just oh, expanding my knowledge through my courses. My courses this year are focused on the integration of digital hardware with software languages, including transistor layout and fabrication, hardware logic design, and coding practice in C, Java, and assembly languages. Okay, so you're speaking a totally different language than the average person. Uh, totally fine. Like if you're if you're speaking in Wired magazine or, you know, to a, a, a and that's that's pulp computer talk too. <laughs> I don't know what, you know, mass media. Um, but so, so in computer circles, um, all that language would be fine. Um, for me, it's very difficult to read and, and get anything out of that. I don't know, this is just a very short little thing in the chat. But um, so let's, let's, do you mind talking for a bit about it, Amy? You want to turn on your mic and can you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, perfect. <laughs> My mic wasn't working earlier today, so I wasn't sure if it was going to work. Uh, what, here. Well, so what got you into computers? Why was that interesting for you? Um, I'm just super interested in technology in general. Um, and my dad has an electrical engineering degree. So I have a little bit of background of seeing him work with that and, and that type of thing. So um, I really but, felt that that was the direction for me to go. Well, what, what's your goal? What do you want to do? Um, I don't know yet. Uh, I'm really just excited to be learning as much as I can and, and finding that type of thing. Over the summer, I worked in IT, and I thought that was really very interesting. Um, I do really want to try to bridge the gap in the technology liter literacy um, and take a look at how people can um, use technology to its fullest extent and see, you know, especially people who are older or in communities that don't have access to as many computers and systems and such, um, I would really like to look into uh, how we can help those people. Well, why would computer literacy or tech literacy be important for an older person? Um, because it's becoming such a huge part of the world. We're like right now we're having a full meeting on Zoom. Um, and you look at in Saskatchewan, the vaccine passport says just help, helping my grandfather. He doesn't own a computer. He doesn't own a phone. We're trying to figure out that QR code system for him and, you know, taking a look at, at all of that. It's such a big part of the world that I think it's super important that everybody has access and everybody has at least a little knowledge of how to use these things. Absolutely. I think that's a service that would be very well received. Um, I think, especially older people who might feel like they've been forgotten and and left behind, um, to have someone like you who would care enough to to identify, you know, three or four things that that any senior should know how to use, and then and then figure out how to not using any of that language that you used in that chat, <laughs> how to how to show them. How to how to use it because it's really important that you you're able to speak to your sister in Victoria or your grandchildren in Regina, um, and this is what you you're missing out on. And 
or, or if you go into a restaurant and you can't figure out how to use the QR code on your phone, um, so you can't read the menu. And, and if you could read the menu on your phone, you can expand it so it's big enough to, so you could see with your eyes. You know, I think there's so many little things that you could do to, in that area, um, taking your computer background and, and, and bringing it out to a senior. I would focus on seniors. I think that is fantastic because there's more and more seniors feeling less and less connected probably. Um, Amy, the, just listening to you, and I'm just going to add say everything that Jay just said, but but the other two is that even just the story of you working with your grandpa to, to, yeah. to get his QR code, that that is such a great story that everybody would be reading because, and everyone should be, because we have this um, poor understanding that everybody has good access to computers that everyone has a cell phone that everyone and we don't like that's not even close to true right yeah. and so that first person story that you just related would would be I'm sure that like Star Phoenix CBC any of those would pick it up just like that um, yeah. and even it's just like a first person story you know it's like this is what what we had to try and do to try and you know get my grandpa hooked into our new modern like this this is now law as of this morning in saskatchewan you have to show you have right. to show your vaccine status so you know how did you how did you navigate that so yeah that that's a great story teaching tech to my grandpa yeah. I can, I can, that's <laughs> and also this is another thing about the audience um so that that put together as a podcast or a blog will probably won't hit your audience. You, you, you probably need to be in the print version of the paper because that's, I mean, the, traditionally that, that was the, the media for, for your grandpa and his generation. Um, Absolutely. You really but do. I have a question with that. Um, yeah. I do find it a little bit more difficult to explain you know if I don't have that person right there to talk to and see that they're ex that they're understanding you know how um, it doesn't really matter with technology there's always going to be different vocabulary and that type of thing how do I not lose my audience if I'm if I can't see their their reactions yeah uh, you're talking about when you're talking to the editor of the of the paper or are you talking uh, about your, your actually your audience, your, your senior audience? No, I mean, like if, uh, like you mentioned newspaper, and I think that's a really great, uh, great point. Um, but if it was like, you know, a presentation like this, I could ha hear the questions, I could see the people's faces of the people who have their cameras on and, and see if they're really following along or not. Um, if it's a paper, a print publication, I, I do feel that I kind of lose that a bit and I'm not sure how, um, how well my work is being understood. Right. So that, that's coming from a person, Amy, you, um, who is so comfortable in, in alternate media. And I say alternate as, which is like mainstream now, but social media, YouTube, uh, podcasting where you, 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 you can, I guess you don't get immediate feedback for any of those. It's more like clicks and likes and comments. But either way, you, you know that you're engaging with people. And in print, yeah, that has always been a challenge with print. And that's probably one reason why print is, is struggling. I mean, there's other reasons, obviously. But to, have, to be able to trace or track that interaction is, is one of the really valuable parts of um, electronic media. So yeah, you won't know, you know, and most people like I'm still involved in print. I hardly get any comments about anything ever. Uh, so I don't know if I'm engaging with my audience, but then we did a poll and people say they read Canola Digest like crazy, but we have to do an actual poll to find, like, or a survey to find that out. Otherwise I'm totally in the dark. <laughs> right. Yeah. Amy, I know one of the things, I'm just going to jump in here. Yeah, and I know please. that as someone who, who writes a lot, um, if I'm breaking something down and I want it to be that sort of step by step, um, I, before it goes to print, I'll actually ask other people to read it. Like, can, can you follow these steps? Where did I miss? You know, like, 
did did this work for you you know that kind of thing and kind of and use that sort of informal feedback that you can maybe ask you know uh, an aunt or a grandma or your next door neighbor or something like that you know it's like okay i want to teach you how to do this can you follow these steps did are they understandable did they work for you you know that kind of thing and that can be a way to kind of um make sure that you're that you're doing your due diligence and, and having breaking it down in a way that is understandable to as many people as possible sort of before you go to the publication stage so that might be a, a solution as well and i was just that was chatting great. off thinking nope. off the top of my head and solving that did we get yeah. to everybody anybody else want to to jump in so there's few there's more people participating than in the chat i think so i if anybody wants to share an idea or some research. Okay, any, anybody have questions for me? Um, like, I, I, So I've been involved in agriculture, but I am interested in lots of other things. So I could, including uh, uh, prairie history. So that's one of the ways I connected with Merle a year ago or so. Um, I find that very interesting, particularly the indigenous history. Hakan, um, you have your your hand raised. Go ahead. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Oh yeah, I well, uh, I was going to ask Jay what what uh, made you decide what you do today. You know what what how what what uh, did inspire you to where you are? Yeah, and that's a question. That's a question people love to answer. So thank you. Um, oh, you're welcome. <laughs> I grew up in, uh, on a farm in Southwest Manitoba, and I grew up. Uh, you know, this is before social media, before cell phones. And so I actually had to listen to the radio. And basically the only radio station that came in uh, very well was CBC. So I spent a lot of time listening to CBC radio. And I always thought that I'd like to be uh, on the radio. Um, so, and I, the funny thing is I didn't, my path wasn't straight. I didn't go into journalism until I was 24. Um, but, uh, and I don't know whether I'm a very good storyteller. I think my, I'm a better listener, um, which also is, a, is a, clearly an important skill. But so I, I wanted to, you know, out of all the things I could imagine doing when I was a teenager, um, speaking on the radio was the, the top. <laughs> and uh, I went into print because it's more money in, in print. And I didn't have to commute as far back then when my career was just, just starting. So that's how I ended up in print. But radio is my first love. And so I do some podcasting on the side. And to be able to actually have these, these, these conversations with you folks today, I find that very rewarding because I think I'm a, better, I'm a better listener than a writer. I'm probably a better talker than a writer. But if I would, so I would say I'm a number one listener, talker here, writer here, even though I spend most of my time writing. But um, yeah, and I, and, and agriculture and i know you're not all involved in agriculture but my son asked me the other day he's taking a business course at st lawrence college in kingston and he said uh, what, what do you what would you say to somebody who doesn't really know what they want to do <laughs> and I, so my advice was to go and do five different jobs in five different places over five years and just learn about yourself learn about how to be a a better employee, learn about how to be a better boss, learn how to interact with people. You could learn so much in five years, um, just, you know, getting your hands dirty all around the world. So I gave him a couple of suggestions. And the other thing is I would take an agriculture degree um, because you, you could branch agriculture into almost anything you can imagine. I guess I'm biased, but um, <laughs> I, I, I get to write about so much stuff. I interviewed, so here's a little story. I interviewed a chef uh, last week. I went and visited her restaurant in Toronto a month ago because we were there for a family holiday. Her name's Elia Herrera um, and her restaurant's called Calibri. So I asked her, what, did, what does Calibri mean? Um, and she's from Mexico originally and has been in Canada for 17 years. And she said, it means hummingbird in Spanish. And then she said, um, but in, in ancient Mayan language, they also use the same word to mean messenger. And then in ancient Aztec language, they use the same word for warrior. And she said, I think of myself as a warrior. And then she said, um, I, I'm doing this because of my grandmother who was a chef and she inspired me to be a, a good strong woman. And I'm, 
and I will fight every day for her. I thought, well, okay, that's pretty awesome. Anyway, so you, you never know what a conversation about fish tacos in a Toronto restaurant uh, can turn into, but but Hakan, Hakan asking questions like you asked me can uh, can turn into some kind of interesting stuff. So good question. Thank you. Thank you. I, I echo Vedahi's, you know, comment. She's like, that's great advice. Five jobs, five years. Yeah, except me, I'm like, you know, I turned 50 next week. So I'm like, yeah, I don't know if I want to like change up and have five different jobs between that and now. <laughs> Go for it. <laughs> I turned 50 in uh, December. Ah, yes. I kind of figured we were pretty similar. Yeah, yeah it, it's, it's, uh, but I do, I do really appreciate that you're, um, not only did you give your son that advice, but you, you allowed and gave the space to, to sample different things, which I'm also a parent. So I'm like, good job. That's awesome. Because it's hard. Um, we have this built in understanding that you're going to come out of university with a degree and you're going to do that thing, whatever that thing is forever. Yeah. That's the scariest thing in the world to me. And I'm, I'm <laughs> almost 50. I still want to do a whole bunch of different things again, that, which is why being a, a journalist in agriculture is so rewarding because I, I actually can, <laughs> I can write about the history of indigenous farming in Western Canada. Then the next day I'm talking to a chef in Toronto and then the next day I'm talking to someone who's invented a robot that goes out and weeds the crops all by itself. So you, you could, it's the whole spectrum of things uh, in food production, anything you can imagine. Does anyone have any final thoughts or questions for Jay? I learned so much, I always do. But I, I do think that 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 even if even if this was sort of about pitching and science communication, I think that, that so many of the things that you brought to us today really apply to any kind of communication that you're doing. I don't care if you're giving a presentation at at in university for a class that you're taking, or you know, all the way up to you know, actually writing an article that you're gonna send to the Globe and Mail. And Sheila, I think you should do that. You're 50 yeah. days without social media, you should totally. write that up. Um and and but still those those very basic communication skills and I just want to say thanks to Jay for being with us today and for bringing that and with that I'm going to Vedahi you can take yeah. us home. I completely echo Meryl this has been such a rewarding session we're so happy that we had you as our first speaker. Uh, thank you for all the practical tips that you gave us and also for listening to each of our stories it's really I think we've just shared so many brilliant ideas and thank you for your time and for sharing your experience with us it means the world as students and young people um, and also thank you to everyone that came out um, a lot of new names and faces and I really hope that you continue to join us this is the type of conversations that we have and we welcome you back to our space um, in the coming weeks and I look forward to reading all those stories um, in addition to the spaces that uh, Jay mentioned to pitch articles um, the chief which is the U of S's student newspaper is also a great place to um, start your writing journey. So I'm the opinions editor and I can put my email in the chat and we take like first person stories. If you take your research and you wanna share like insights from it, um, those are also welcome. So um, please pitch. Um, I think we would love to work with you. So thank you so much, Jay. And thank you everyone. My pleasure. Thank you, great. Thank you Jay. Thank you. Talk to you later. Bye everybody.